Okay, I'm Heiner Linke. I'm at the Nanometer Structure Consortium in Lund, which does research and technology development around nanoscience. And I'd like to talk about three ideas around the idea how nanoscience or nanotechnology could contribute to a cleaner or safer energy, which is, of course, one of the main challenges if we talk about global challenges. Um, I would like to start by talking a bit about what nano actually means. I would guess that most of you know that nano means very, very small. I'd like to start by just saying how small. I'll just give you some idea. Um, if you imagine you take uh, the whole Earth, the whole globe, and reduce it enough to become as large as a football, so that's about 50 million times smaller, and then you imagine you do the same thing one more time. You take the football and take it down another 20 or 50 million times. Then you're at the size of what you call a nanoparticle, something that is on the size range of a few thousand atoms or so, a ball of material. Now, why are we interested in this? The, the main reason, sometimes the reason is that not making things small, that's just the point. So, for example, if you try to build faster and more powerful computers, that's what you want. You want to make smaller transistors so that you can pack many of them into a small space. They can talk quickly to each other, and that's the whole point. But what makes nanoscience really exciting is when something else happens, when you go from just smaller to something new, some new behavior that didn't exist before. And one example for this is what happens to gold if you make it smaller. So if you imagine a gold coin, and I cut it in two pieces, and then you know what the two pieces will look like. They will look like two half gold coins. <laughs> if you make them even smaller, you get smaller gold pieces, but they look exactly the same. And that goes on for a very long time, down this 20 million factor of reduction. But at some point, when you get to the nano size, and then they're so small you cannot touch them anymore, you can, for instance, have them dissolved in water. And if the projector would produce the colors properly, then you would see that they would be red. So you have gone from gold colored to red. And the reason is simply that small things will interact with light in a different way, and they get entirely new properties. You can put this into a system, and, for example, make a whole range of different colors going from, as you clearly can see, uh, purple on the left and red on the right, <laughs> um, simply by changing the size. So you have now nanoparticles. They're precisely the same material. We're not changing dye or anything. It's the same material, but small particles will give you a blue color, and red and large particles will give a red color. So if you found a new knob in the size range around nanometers, the size will matter in the way that how things behave, you get new properties. So what does this have to do with energy? I'd like to give you three examples now, starting from one extremely fundamental basic research type thing to and ending with a very applied one. And I would like to start by putting into your mind a red flame <laughs> and imagine what, what heat actually is. I would like to remind you of your science classes well, you may remember that what we mean by heat is actually motion. So if I tell you that something is warmer than something else, what we really mean, the strictest definition, is that every electron atom molecule in the warmer thing moves more than in the slower thing, and how much it moves is actually a direct measure of temperature. Now, one of the basic ideas for tonight, or for this talk, is um, just the simple idea, if you have something that moves all the time, you have small particles, we're talking nano, so you can make things small, and they move all the time for free. Couldn't you then do something useful with it? For example, if I would make a very small machine, maybe I could make that machine move just for free, just by using temperature. Or if I know that what electricity really is, is the motion of electrons, and electrons move anyway if they're warm, maybe I can teach them to all move in one direction, and that's a current, and you can power things with that. Um, so let's see whether we can do some of this. And now I would like you to dive into every single of the cells in your body. You will find little machines like this one. Uh, this particular one has as a task to carry things around in cells. There are tracks in cells that are called filaments. There's a skeleton in cells. And stuff needs to be moved around. So one of the clear examples is if a cell divides, Stuff needs to be in the left, and the same stuff needs to be in the right, and somebody has to do that. These guys do this. So they walk around in cells. These are small. It's a few nanometer large. They're proteins. So this is why you need to get your proteins from beans or milk or something. 
because otherwise you don't have them. So they need to move around. They use chemical energy and make motion out of it, and they're really, really small. And the point with that is, and is I would like to show you a movie now, if I told you to build such a machine, I would tell you to build a machine about, out of stuff like this. Now, these are not proteins. They're a bit bigger. These are DNA molecules made, visualized under a microscope. Uh, there's motion because there's some flow in the background. That's not the important thing. But they're wiggling around all the time. And they wiggle around because they get kicked by water molecules all the time. And the water molecules are warm and they move around. So this is what you see here. Now, your task for tonight would be to come up with a concept to build a machine, something that walks out of stuff like this. And I can tell you one thing that any way you have ever built, or anybody, any person has ever built a, mo a motor will before will not work, because there's no, this is like building a motor with screws and pieces that jump around all the time and fall off the table and are soft and wiggly and just nothing to build with. But biology has achieved this, and here's just another um, picture of one of these motors that walk along tracks. This one is called Myosin 5. It's related to the motors that power your muscles when you move around. They are also small motors. And I would like to quickly show you a little bit how this works, how people think this one works, because I want to also highlight how it works different from any motor we have ever built. The idea is there are two heads involved. Biologists call them heads, the things that you walk with, like down there, they call them heads. Um, so there are two feet, let's, let's just say feet. And they are chemically the same thing. This one looks the same as this, and they come in two states. There's a leg attached to the foot, as you can see, and the leg can either be forward-leaning or backward-leaning. So right now I have one of each, and I'm sort of in a relaxed state. In which state I am depends on what, uh, whether I'm eating chemical energy or not. So I'm going through a chemical cycle, I'm going through reactions. And one of the first things that will happen when both feet are attached is that the front foot will also go into this forward-leaning state. Now, if you try to be empathetic with me, you will feel some strain in the back of my leg. And that's important because this is the way they talk to each other. The front one tells the back one, I'm leaning forward now, I'm bound properly, you can let go. Because you cannot let go both at the same time, then you're gone because of diffusion. So the front one tells the back one, you can let go now, it goes in the next cycle. And now what happens? I'm a molecule, I'm in warm water, so I'm moving around. And the point, this is important, because this, now something comes for free. I do not need to step. I don't need to jog or anything. I can just say, well, heat is doing the job for me. All I need to do is wait until my foot is where I want it to be, it, and then I hold on. So I didn't need to move. Uh, diffusion did this for me. And this is not something you can do with big machines. You can only do this with small machines, very small machines. Um, yeah, so here's an animation what this looks like if you try to do all the math properly. And just to get home, the point that I would like to make here is from now on, when you think of your cells and what's going on in there, I would like to think you like this. OK. So at the nanoscale, things move around all the time, and you can use this. And this is actually a project where we are trying to, uh, a consortium of people in different countries is trying to actually build one of these from scratch to build a protein motor that actually does this. And also this one is designed, there's nothing in this motor that pushes or moves or anything. It is only done by controlling diffusion, by controlling random motion in molecules. It doesn't exist yet because this is really, really hard to build this. And I cannot even tell you what it will be good for. So this one will be good for understanding how these things work. But everything in your body works like this. And I think it is important to understand these things. And I'm also pretty sure that the really cool applications of molecular motors, either biological ones or artificial ones, we haven't thought of yet. I, can, I am convinced that in 20 or 30 years, we will use them for something really useful. <laughs> OK, but to go a little bit closer to where we are now, the other idea I offered was maybe we can teach electrons to move in one direction, and then we can make current, and current is useful. This exists. You can, you can, this has been known for 100 years or so. You can take pretty much take any chunk of wire you have sitting around at home and put a candle on one end, stick the other end in ice water, and if you measure a voltage, you will measure a small voltage. The reason for the voltage is that the electrons on one side move around a lot. The electrons on the other side are not moving around. And the mechanism for the current to happen is pretty much the same as why the dust ends up under the carpet. Because 
Where you walk around, the dust gets kicked around, under the carpet nobody kicks, and eventually that's all where the dust ends up. This is how these things work. So you move a lot on one end, you move a little at the other end, you get a current. Unfortunately, these things are pretty inefficient. If we knew how to make them more efficient, we could, for instance, do things like this. When you buy gas at the gas station, you buy a certain amount of chemical energy, and something like a third, um, optimistically calculated, is used to move the car forward and to push air out of the way and go somewhere. The rest is friction and other things, but most of it is simply heat going out the exhaust pipe. Some of that has to go out there for the thing to work. This is not it, but there's more going out there than should. And if you had a way of simply using heat to make current, you wouldn't need a generator in your car, which takes about 10 or 15% of the input energy. You could simply run your air conditioning system or your, your headlights or whatever just by using the heat and making electricity out of that. It's not like car companies haven't figured this out. They're actually very, very keen on this technology. The problem is it's not efficient enough and we need better materials to do this. And one of the key problems is the following. If you have something that's red and warm on the one side and blue and cold on the other side, and you want to get a current to flow, so you can use this, this effect that I've talked about to do this, but you want the heat that makes things red and warm on the other side. You want to drive the current, but not leak through the material. Unfortunately, every material conducts also heat, and the heat just short circuits down the, the, the tube that you're trying to use here, the, the uh, wire. And when you try to make the electrons more go in one direction, then usually you make the heat also go better in that direction. So you have something that short circuits the heat that you want to use. So I would like to introduce you to the idea of really, really thin wires, called nanowires, which one can make today. It's a very nicely controlled, um, extremely thin, so on the order of a couple of thousand times thinner than a human hair, which one can control exactly where every atom sits in this wire. And in this particular case, the point is exactly that they're thin, because it turns out if you want to get a current through there, that still works pretty well, even if they are thin. You just need many of them to get a current through there. But heat doesn't travel so well at any longer. So the, the lattice vibrations that carry heat actually get scattered by the surface of the wire. And there's just so much surface if you have many, many thin wires that in the end they become like an isolator for heat and like a conductor for current. And that's exactly the type of material one is looking for to make better thermoelectrics. So this is something that's happening very active, and there's a decent chance that you will see this being used in maybe not five years, but maybe a bit beyond that. In, and this could save a lot of energy because there's a lot of heat around that doesn't get used for anything. And with that, I would like to jump to something that is really around the corner to be used, and that has to do with solar power. Of course, solar power is being used. In fact, maybe to a larger degree than you may be aware, um, here's a graph from a recent day, a sunny Saturday in Germany a few months ago, where around lunchtime when peak electricity use happened, 40% of the peak electricity use were produced by solar power. Now, this is, you can say, this was, of course, in the middle of the day when the sun is up and not in the middle of the night. Taking over 24 hours, it was only 20%, but still a lot. It was also on a weekend when companies didn't work, and yes, it was a sunny Saturday and not a rainy Saturday, but it's still, it is a pretty remarkable. So down here you have nuclear power. This was the solar power that day, the yellow graph up there. And this is something like 20,000 megawatts. That is about as much as 10 to 15 nuclear power stations. This is electric photovoltaic panels installed in Germany right now. And what's even more remarkable is that something like a third of these were installed in the 12 months or 18 months or so before this. This is a really fast trend, so solar power is really happening. And it won't be long, and this will also be true not on only sunny Saturdays in May, but also on other days. So solar power is happening, and it is, for, it is here to stay, and it will make a difference. But there are still issues. You need to do this. Um, you can be smart about it and, and use all the available areas. But you still need to cover a lot of area to do this. And a lot of area requires a lot of material. Material is expensive and also may be limited, depending on what you use. Now, this is silicon, and silicon is not so limited. But this stuff is also energy consuming to produce. So you are interested in doing this with less material. And again, these nanowires can make a difference here. 
And I would like you to bring you back to my very first point that nanomaterials interact differently with light. In this case, there's two things interesting about nanowires. One of them, if you make them right, you can actually make a solar cell out of each nanowire. And in the future, hopefully, it will be possible to put several in a, in a row so that each single wire can use the whole spectrum or a very large part of the solar spectrum. But the key point here is that just because they are thin makes them interact differently with light and they absorb light much better. So where currently you need a thick layer of solid material to absorb the light that you need to make the solar cell work, with nanowires you need a thinner layer and only wire sticking up because they, need to, they interact much better with the light, they absorb it better, so that you can, in the end, the, it, is, it is realistic that you can use the same produce the same electricity with only a few percent of the material, and the rest in between could be something like plastic, so that can actually be produced or is, is available in, in a much better way. Um, yeah, and with that I would like to end and just sort of say that um, Yes, I took you on a long journey from very basic research to something that's around the corner. Um, and that is maybe also highlighting that we really need the whole spectrum. We need the very basic research to be able to do the really applied research and to make a difference. So thank you very much.